Greetings, everyone. I am Rob Priestley, the Vice Dean for Innovation at Princeton University. And I'd like to welcome you all back to the second day of Empower 2021, a conference celebrating Black academic entrepreneurship. I again would like to acknowledge the conference sponsors who have made this event possible. They include MasterCard Center for Inclusive Growth, the National Urban League, the legal firm Mintz, the accounting and business advisory firm, Eisner Amper, and the Foundation for Health Advancement, which fosters New Jersey's innovation ecosystem. As a quick recap of yesterday's events, the opening keynote discussion, Minding the Gaps, Creating Opportunities, I spoke with Gabby Solzberger, Senior Advisor to Two Stigma Impact Fund and a trustee of the Ford Foundation, Mike Froman, Vice Chair and President of Strategic Growth at MasterCard, and the president of their Center for Inclusive Growth. Our discussion framed the reason why we've come together for this conference, that is the inequities that African-Americans face in entrepreneurship and how do we overcome the gaps and level the playing field. There were three great panel discussion sessions addressing important aspects of an academic founder and indeed many other founders around topics that they must overcome with regards to being successful. These included technology transfer, non-dilutive funding sources for pre-seed startups, and different ways to accelerate the company. The discussion supported and emphasized the need to work together to increase diversity amongst academic founders. The day closed with a very exciting pitch competition, and I would like to congratulate all of the semifinalists and most certainly a big shout out goes to the grand prize winner, Sinove Labs. They won $100,000 in non-diluted funding, as well as a generous package of in-kind legal and financial advisory services. It was great to see so many high quality academic startups with black founders apply to the pitch competition. It was extremely difficult to select the finalists from so many high quality applications that we received. In the interest of getting strong black academic startups funded as well as networked, we organized behind the scenes for all 15 of the semifinalists to have four one-on-one -on -one sessions with different funding groups. We most certainly look forward to hearing about the success of those meetings, whether they lead to funding or simply to advice and connections, all semifinalists would have benefited. Now, in case you missed it, Yesterday, Pablo de Benedetti, Princeton's Dean for Research, announced several new initiatives to support a more inclusive research, innovation, and entrepreneurship ecosystem at Princeton and beyond. These in initiatives add to the university's larger plan to combat inequities in our society. I'll summarize these new programs for you here in brief but I would encourage you to go to our website, innovation.princeton.edu to learn more about these important initiatives and ways in which Princeton is addressing anti-racism and trying to enhance equity. So first, we announced that Princeton is establishing a new innovation fund to support research collaborations between Princeton faculty and their colleagues at minority serving institutions. These funds will be for the sciences, the engineering, the humanities, as well as the social sciences. Second, 
we announced a distinguished visiting public lecture series to bring underrepresented and inspirational figures to campus. In addition to a public lecture, there will also be small gatherings with graduate students and postdocs. Third, a new program was announced that will help to develop high impact new ventures. Start at Princeton, as it is called, is a new academic accelerator with a particular focus on underrepresented groups and entrepreneurship. Start entrepreneurs will receive seat support and education over a 30 month accelerator program at Princeton University and the Princeton Innovation Center Biolabs. We look forward to working, welcoming the first cohort start entrepreneurs to Princeton this upcoming September. And finally, we announced an exciting, um, as well as discussion that Princeton had been selected as the principal institution for a new National Science Foundation, i Hub. Our hub termed the Northeast Hub is a collaboration with many other institutions, including HBCUs, and already has a demonstrated commitment to inclusivity and diversity that will be maintained throughout the entire duration of the i Hub. And now, looking forward to today's sessions, we have focused the content around supporting, funding, and accelerating academic startups. In the first session, which is a keynote session, Brent Henry will speak to Ken Chenault about leadership, the need for industry to help drive racial equity, as well as Ken's one-tenth initiative. The second session, which is also a keynote, will feature Professor Joe DeSimone of Stanford University. Professor DeSimone has had a distinguished academic career and a distinguished career as a successful founder and entrepreneur, having launched several unicorns based off on foundational academic research. Joe will share with us some keys to his entrepreneurial success and how diversity is embedded in all that he does. After these keynote sessions, we will have several more panels, including discussions amongst venture capitalists, giving their advice to founders, a conversation of how founders can use industry collaborations, which is a key component of academic research to achieve success, and then a discussion amongst successful Black academic founders. There will also be a discussion about building Black entrepreneurial ecosystems that will bring together all of the conversations from today as well as yesterday. We'll also incorporate discussion about the ongoing impact of the race riots in Tulsa 100 years ago and what needs to be done now to rebuild Black Wall Street. We will then end um, and break into 17 different roundtable discussions about topics on relevant to content over the past two days. Please take advantage of these discussion tables to connect with other participants to brainstorm and create actionable items that can be done to continue to move forward in building inclusive ecosystems. You're welcome to stay in just one discussion table or jump around to different tables for conversation. Then finally, we're honored to have George T. French Jr., the president of Clark Atlanta University, close out the conference for us by speaking about what HBCUs and we together as a community can do to develop equitable access to entrepreneurial resources. We have a lot of great content planned for today. And so without further delay, please um, allow me to introduce uh, Brent Henry, a member of the law firm Mintz and a former trustee of Princeton University to introduce the first plenary session today. Due to a scheduling issue, this session has been pre-recorded, and so we will not have the opportunity to take questions live from the audience. So this video will run at approximately 11.15, so two minutes from now. Please stay tuned.
Rod, thank you. It's my distinguished pleasure to introduce Ken Chenault. Ken is the chairman and a managing director of the venture capital firm, General Catalyst. Prior to joining General Catalyst, Ken was the chairman and chief executive officer of American Express, a position he held from 2001 to 2018. At General Catalyst, Ken focuses on investing in fast growing companies that have the potential to become large fundamental institutions. He also provides invaluable guidance to portfolio companies, particularly those with an eye toward global markets and responsible innovation as they scale their teams and products. Ken serves on the boards of Airbnb, Berkshire Hathaway, Chief, Guild Education, and the Harvard Corporation. He's also a co-founder of 110, a coalition of leading executives coming together to upskill, hire, and advance 1 million Black Americans over the next 10 years. Ken, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Brent, it's glad to be with you and uh, glad to be with the group. So let's start with a few questions. Warren Buffett has described you as the quote, gold standard for corporate leadership and the benchmark that I measure others against, unquote. Can you share with us your leadership philosophy and qualities that have served you so well over your career? So one, I think what I would first preface, and I certainly uh, appreciate uh, Warren's uh, kind words, uh, but I think any leader certainly has made mistakes. Uh, so I would take the gold standard adjective, uh, take it as a perspective uh, and certainly not perfect. Uh, but I would say Brent, what I've always tried to do in my life is to try to frame what I'm going to do against some simple objectives and some very concrete aspirations. Now, the mantra that I follow from a leadership standpoint uh, comes from Napoleon, and I preface it that I don't want to wind up like Napoleon. But I paraphrased a few sentences from him that I think summarize my defini definition of leadership. And that is that the role of a leader is to define reality and give hope. And if you think about what leadership is about, part of what you have to do is you have to define what's the reality of the situation you're in. You have to, in fact, look at both the challenges and the opportunities. You have to examine the weaknesses and the strengths. And we all know it's sometimes very hard to, in fact, define what reality is. And so it's absolutely essential that the leader have the capacity to define reality. But that's not enough. That just tells you what the situation is. So how to engender hope? What are the tactics? What are the strategies that in fact will elevate you from the situation that you're in? And one of the things that I think is very important from a leadership standpoint that I believe is critical is you have to, in fact, create an environment of trust. You have to operate with integrity because you're not gonna believe in me. You're not gonna have that hope unless you trust me. And so for me, the operating definition that I use for integrity is consistency of words and actions. And I think that it's not an objective, frankly, that I'm perfect at, but it's an objective that, frankly, I do try to reach. And the other qualities that I think are important is the ability to create a vision and a strategy, the ability at the end of the day to win both the hearts and minds of people. And that means that you need to be able to communicate 
a vision. You need to be able to create in people an understanding that you're authentic. And I also think it's important for the leader to in fact demonstrate both compassion and decisiveness. Because what I firmly believe in is that I wanna be a leader for the long term. One can certainly lead through fear, but at the end of the day, I don't think that works in the long term. Okay. And so I think you've got to make a conscious decision as to what type of leader you want to be. Right. So let me ask a question about some of the hurdles you faced. Crisis management often defines one's legacy. So what were some of your personal experiences at Amex and guiding Amex through crisis? So I certainly in my 17 year tenure, experienced a range of crises. Obviously one of the first crises that I had to face was my first year as CEO, uh, which was 9-11. Hmm. And that was one, Brent, that it certainly was challenging to define what reality would be. And what was critical in that crisis, and I in fact said this to my top leadership team two hours after the attack on the World Trade Center, was that leadership reputations are made or lost during times of crisis. And what was important is that we had to exercise decisiveness and compassion. We had to prioritize what were the most important actions, the most important action that we needed to focus on was the safety and security of our people, the safety and security of our customers, and in fact, anyone that we could help around the world. And I think what was very important in the 9-11 crisis was to demonstrate a high level of compassion. We lost 11 of our colleagues. And as soon as I could, I tried to meet with each of the families of those that perished. And also to make sure that we were administering to the needs of our colleagues and our customers. At the same time that I was demonstrating compassion, I had to assess the reality of the situation that American Express was in. And we were in a free fall. Business travel had stopped, consumer travel obviously had stopped, spending dropped precipitously. And a month after 9-11, I had to make the decision that we would lay off close to 15% of our workforce. That was a very painful action that I had to take. And I talked about how painful it was to our people because I wanted them to understand one is wasn't their fault, but at the end of the day, the survival of the company, and it was that dire, was at stake. And what was also important is that the people that we laid off, I said, we're gonna give them as generous severance benefits as we can afford because of the challenging times that they will face as a result of being laid off. And then what we also focused on was to put together a strategy for the company 
not just the immediate strategy, but what's the pathway forward over the next three to five years? And while we were confronting these challenges, I also focused on some areas of opportunity for the company in the moderate term. And one of the things that I think is important when you're in a crisis is you want to emerge stronger. You want to fortify yourself. And that's what we did relative to our cost structure, the investment in the business, the investment in our people. And we were able to emerge a stronger company post 9-11. And we went through some of this, some similar steps with the financial crisis. One of the things that was very important, for example, is I decided that we were not going to cut the dividend for the company. That I thought that our commitment to our shareholders was very important and that many people depended on that dividend. Right. And so I think what's critical here is you've got to understand what your priorities are. And as I said, our first priority, and I think in any crisis, you've got to be clear about what your first priority was. And that was safety and security. Right. But then you've got to say, wait a minute, I've got to focus on not just the company surviving, but how can I position the company to thrive? Sure. So many, um, so many, those two examples are, are so instructive given today's situation with the pandemic. So now you're a general catalyst. So what advice are you imparting to the leaders of your portfolio companies with all that in mind? So I, I think, Brent, what is very interesting, and I think we would all admit that um, the pandemic has exposed the gaps in our society and the major challenges that black and brown people have had, that all lower income people have had, really the health disparities, all of that. The reality is from a business standpoint, when we were in the early days of the pandemic, there were big concerns about what was gonna happen. And one of the things that I did was to set up sessions with all of our portfolio companies. One, to talk about what are your priorities? What are your priorities around your people? What are your priorities around your customers and clients? And what are steps that you need to take? Very, in a very basic way for some of the companies was, do you have enough cash? to get through, what are you doing to strengthen your balance sheet? And I went through, what are the expectations that your people have of you as a leader? And what do you need to do to fulfill those expectations? At the same time, I talked to them about, look at what some of the opportunities are. Now, the reality is, for the vast majority of our companies, and I would say for the business world in general, the pandemic was not as severe as we thought it would be. However, as we all know, the impact on some small businesses and some medium and large companies was more pronounced, but in general, the economic impact was frankly not as great as I thought it would be in the early days of the pandemic. But what was important was to make sure that the companies were taking the actions, one for their people, two for their business, and three for their investors. So important, yeah, this is really helpful. So let's talk about our another important issue or a real important issue right now, not just the pandemic, but the issue of race, inclusion, and access. It's one of the reasons why the Empower Conference was actually organized. What role do you think industry and other corporate leaders should be playing to address those issues? I think what's 
absolutely core. And, and I think why this conference is, is so important is I'm a believer in capitalism. But what I also firmly believe is that we have a responsibility to the broader society. And the rationale for me is I want to build enduring companies. And to build an enduring company, we need a healthy society. And I think that companies exist because society allows us to exist. And so when people talk about entitlement, frankly, sometimes I hear some of my corporate colleagues talk about entitlement. I say, we are an entitlement. Right. Right. Don't, don't take for granted that, that we should exist. Uh, and so we have, we have a great responsibility. And the examples that I would give Brent, uh, one is there, I said this to a few people at a, a number of people at a conference several months ago. I told the story of Tom Watson at IBM. Tom Watson opposed separate but equal and said at the IBM plants, we are not going to have separate but equal and move some of his facilities. Brown v. Board of Education, I said, just think if the corporate community had said, after Brown v. Board, we're gonna integrate our ranks. We're gonna, we're gonna be more diverse. The impact on our society would be unparalleled. And so I think that it is very important. And one of the philosophies that we're trying to espouse at General Catalyst is we've developed a concept that we call responsible innovation. And what we believe is that companies, startups need to focus on what we call four pillars that can make a difference. Economic inclusion. The reality is when, we're when, we, when we are developing products and services, do we really understand what the impacts are? on different segments of our population. Certainly we've got to focus on the environment and sustainability. We've got to focus on diversity and inclusion and privacy and data security is very important. And I think that my view is given the racial gaps that are there, companies need to address very directly that gap because they have contributed to that gap. They're not, they can't be bystanders. They have to be active participants in closing that gap. Right. So I take it that that was part of your impetus in uh, your decision to form 110. And uh, so tell us a little bit more about that. It, it's a fascinating challenge and uh, it does express a lot of hope. So after, two days after the murder of George Floyd, Ken Frazier and I discussed what could we do that could make a difference. And we were able to recruit Ginny Rometty, the former CEO of IBM, Kevin Shera, who was the CEO of Amgen, uh, and, Charles Phillips, uh, who was formerly the CEO of, of Infor. And what we said was, it's important for the private sector to deal with the issue of black unemployment and the fact that there had not been a long-term effort with real metrics in place. So what we said with 110 
is we want to create a million jobs in 10 years for Black Americans in family sustaining jobs, not dead end jobs. And the focus was on Black Americans who did not have or do not have a four year college degree. It does not mean that we are not committed to the advancement of Blacks uh, getting, uh, uh, going to college and graduate school, but our view was we need a focus and if we could make progress with that segment, it could have a major impact. And we went to companies and I will say very frankly, one of the initial reactions was well, we're a little bit concerned that the focus is just on black Americans. So the point that we made was you have initiatives and should on a range of diverse people. This organization at this point in time is gonna be focused on black Americans. But now let's look at what we're talking about. Sy systemic racism, part of it is when you do the same thing, and you get the same result. And you say, I really tried. So I said, what's, we said, what's one of the biggest issues that is an impediment for blacks? It is that they don't have a college degree. And close to 70% of the jobs in corporate America above $70,000 or $75,000 require a college degree. It is, and in many cases, over 60% of the cases, it's not relevant. And so take a skills first approach. And we said there are some companies that in fact have taken a skills first approach uh, and have not required a college degree. So there won't be a diminution of quality because we're focused on output and you have credentials that are not relevant to the job. So that's one of the objectives. Then we said, while we are doing this to improve the situation with black Americans, if you change the specs of the job, that impacts everyone. So as an organization, we're gonna keep our focus on black Americans, but in fact, understand this is gonna benefit everyone. Uh, and I think what's important about this, Brent, is we now have over 57 large companies. I would say 75% of them are in the Fortune 100. Uh, and they've made a 10-year commitment, financial commitment, and a 10-year jobs commitment. And that was the other design criteria, was we want persistence and commitment, not just give us money for a year or two, we have to have real objectives. That's really courageous. And it's really heartening to hear some of that progress. And obviously it demonstrates leadership. Uh, we're coming to the end of our interview. And I know that a lot of the people at this uh, conference are actually PhDs, <laughs> academics, who are trying to figure out how to use university IP to their benefit to hopefully become maybe a general catalyst uh, portfolio company someday. Right. So what advice do you have for the conference attendees? So what I would say to the conference uh, attendees, first of all, I am so glad you're focused on this issue. I think one of the things that's most important is how we can increase the level of understanding of the importance of innovation in everything we do. And I actually think the academic environment, if we position this correctly, is an example in a number of areas of innovative thinking and the ability to bring about change. From an entrepreneurial standpoint, I would say, for example, in the black community, there has not been enough focus on how we can build entrepreneurs how we can incent people that they in fact have the ability 
to bring ideas to action. And so part of what I think you've got to do is really focus on helping develop intellectual curiosity. I think that's essential. I think second is educating people to the importance of taking what I call informed risk. Third is there are so many problems in the world that part of what needs to happen from an innovation standpoint is in the classroom, take some of these major problems and talk about what are some of the ideas that could change in a real positive way some of the issues that we're confronting as a society. That's very, very helpful. Ken, um, one observation that you made at the beginning of our discussion was that one of the uh, important characteristics of a leader is to give hope. And obviously you've, you've shared that characteristic in spades, but why, why are you so hopeful? What, what keeps you so optimistic? You know, Brent, it's um, clearly, I'm very focused on all the problems and that we face as a society. And my experience as an African-American is that we have a very long way to go. But what gives me hope, frankly, is the history uh, of what African-Americans have been able to do despite the barriers. And the fact that I really do think both individuals, I obviously think governments are important, but I'm convinced that people can make an incredible difference if they are committed and focused on bringing about real change. So, you know, I often say to the experts, if I gave you the facts 300 years ago of where we would be and where we are, most people would say we wouldn't have been able to make any progress. So I want to be clear in a number of areas, we've got a long way to go. But what gives me, what gives me hope is I think at the end of the day, we're making progress. And I think that our job is for the right reasons to have what I call informed competence, which is let's be crystal clear about the obstacles and challenges. But at the end of the day, from a leadership standpoint, goes back to defining reality. If all we do is define reality and say, hey, there's nothing we can do, that to me is not what leadership is about. So what leadership is about is our job is in fact to communicate a vision and to give the reasons why, not in a uh, closed-minded way, but the reasons why we're going to make it through. And like everyone else, hopefully on this call, we stand on the shoulders of so many people. And my view is our job is to push forward, not just to deal in reality. Let's be clear about reality, but let's say we're going to change it. That's great. No, thank that's very inspiring. And it's obvious that uh, much of your career success has been following those examples of other leaders standing on the shoulders and your legacy is uh, still being written, Ken. I really appreciate it. Well, Let Brent, me just say, thank you. I was just going to say on behalf of Princeton and the other sponsors of this conference, I really want to thank you for sharing all of these valuable insights. It's been very helpful. 
Well, thank you. Well, I look forward to hearing about the output from this conference. And again, I'm, I'm so, so pleased uh, that this conference is taking place. Great, thank you again. Thank you.